Hi, I'm Streaky from Streaky.com. Today is Friday, so it is Q&A day. Hashtag Ask Streaky. I'm Streaky, I'm a mastering engineer from London. I've been mastering for about 25 years for really high-end people, really low-end people, and everybody in between. I come on YouTube every day to review hi-fi equipment, pro audio equipment, discuss mastering, mixing, and how to get your room sounding better, whether that's a listening room or however, you know, wherever you're listening to stuff, how that's gonna sound. So uh, Fridays is Q&A day. So this is questions from the comments that people have left during the week and also on the bottom of this video on a Friday. So uh, let's get cracking. The first one is from Danny Z. He says, how would you approach mastering a DJ mixtape that has different levels? I'm working on a project where the levels are all over the place and there are some distortion during the transitions. Would you recommend an automation in this case or simply send back to him for a redo? Okay, so if the transitions are obviously getting louder because you're mixing the two tracks together, I would just say it needs a bit of pre-production work and some post-production work. Bring everything down by even 10 dBs on in your system before you, you mix them. That'll give you plenty of headroom to get the mixes done and then go through and put a limiter across afterwards, raising them all back up 10 dB or probably 7 dB because you'll need to allow for the humps of where they're getting mixed so they don't sound crushed, but they're still gonna sound pretty loud when you've got them back up there. But yeah, get them all sounding right and the sort of similar levels, similar RMS to start with, and then uh, drop the level and then put all the level back up after it's done. So next question is from uh, Skyman Beats with a Z. Hi Streaky, after taking the Manly New Mew, I wish to take a good EQ for mastering. The first I was going to take was a Dangerous Bax, but I discovered the TK Audio, TK Liza. Have you planned to test it? What do you think? So uh, what would I say to this? A Manly New Mew, great compressor, really good for dance music, really good for most stuff really, because it's not thick and creamy. See the review up there. Good EQ. I mean, the Bax EQ is a great EQ, the Dangerous Bax. The only thing I would say about the Bax is it's quite limited. It's it's a shelving EQ, essentially, so high and low shelf. So that's great as a as an item to have because you can lift the top and the bottom like you can in your car, but you're not going to be able to do any detailed stuff. So I don't know whether you've got something detailed. I would suggest if you're out of the box, I'd be looking at Masselec stuff to start with or some GML or something like that as a parametric EQ rather than just plain shelves. I use plain shelves quite a lot having said that, so I'm being a bit hypocritical, but I have got parametrics too. So it's kind of, they're good to combine those things. They're good for like front of the chain to sort of balance out the mix before you get stuck into any detailed work. Yeah, Bax is great. I've not used the TK Audio. Maybe I'll get one in to try. Not seen it. I will check it out and see if it's something that interests me to review. Yeah, get something parametric so you can get a bit more dialed in. Next one is from Ross Adams. He says, which Lyra are you using? One or two? I have the one. Could I use this for mastering or would I trade the Lyra 2 because it has more impo options? The Lyra 1, of course you can master with it. It is a D to A, A to D in the same way that the Lyra 2 is, uh, but it doesn't have the same digital outputs and inputs. In fact, I don't think it has any. It might have an optical. I need more outputs really. I need more D to A's because I want to be able to send one to the chain. I want to be able to send one to the speakers. I want to be able to send the before so I can hear that. So it's more versatile having the two. And also I like to send digital outs to things. So for me personally, I couldn't use a one. It would be really limiting. But if you are only using it as an in and out for the analog chain and you don't want to monitor that, for example, although having said that, you could use the headphone out on the front as another output to, to then plug that in for your, so you can monitor the before. So I guess you could in a way. Um, so yeah, I would use it for mastering. The two is, is obviously the better one, but yeah, you can. So next one is from Can The Loop. This is quite a long, long one, so uh, grab a tea. I'm listening these days more and more about how good is to mix directly through master processing, like limiting and stuff. That sounds to me like mastering my own production, which I'm certainly concerned that I'm able to do, neither my room. That's why I leave my master bus completely dry. How much master bus processing can we allow ourselves to do without leaving the safe zone? And there's one more question. Should we send and fund our production for mastering 
onto our label or is it better, a better idea to leave that for the labels houses to do? Because my track's meant to be sent to them anyway. Thank you, okay. So first one is how much um, limiting and stuff can you leave on your mix bus? I think I've mentioned this before, but I think if that's part of your mix, if you're mixing into that and that's how you've learned how to mix and that's part of your sound, then that's fine. That is your sound. So if you've got a compressor on the mix bus and it's doing its thing and it sounds great and you like that sound, that's all right. Leave it on there. As long as it's not distorting or over clipping and things like that, then that's not really a problem. Uh, a limiter, similar thing. A limiter is essentially a compressor, but you know, very fast and, and a bigger ratio. So similar thing there. Ideally, don't put a limiter on because it's going to shave a lot of the peaks off so it's not really doing a lot of pumping work but it's adding flavor and tone also as i've mentioned is that every record that i get into master from major labels i always get a mastered version because the mix engineer has always done a mastered version for them because he can't send it in without you know it being loud so that they can hear how it's going to sound. The label will then ask for one without the limiter on, and there I get that one and I get the other one, so I can hear what they're going for, and then I can better that or you know do the same. So that's kind of how that works in a, in the pro world. So it's no different in any part of the the business. I would say if that's part of your sound, do it. I would always expect a mastering engineer to probably get a better job, depending on who the mastering engineer is, than what you can do with your own test mastering, mainly because they're coming from a different place they're listening to it in a different way and they're not as involved in the in the music side of things and the mix and the balance and things like that as you are they're listening to the veneer so it's more a kind of a different process so they're probably going to be able to get a bit more out of it that kind of leads on to the next question which is I've kind of answered is that if you're going to a label yeah do them a version that is you know, sounds pretty finished if you can, if you've got those skills. If you haven't got this, the skills or if you haven't pushed it into the master bus, there's no reason why you shouldn't send it to a mastering engineer and then just and get it mastered because you've got more chance of, you know, getting the track passed if you've done a spec mix or whatever, then you've got that chance of getting it through when it's loud and sounding better and it's obviously going to go out into the world. You know that it's going how it's going to sound then, so it's kind of finished. They usually tend to go and remaster it, but if I get something in and it already sounds mastered and is really good, well, I'm not going to touch it because my job, as I always say, is to do nothing. So really, if it comes in really loud, really separated, sounds great, why would I need to get involved? I usually can't get involved at that stage because it's already mastered. So I would always say probably master it before it goes to the label because once it's out in the world, it's out in the world. And a lot of times a record label will have an in with a certain mastering engineer that they like and they've got a relationship with. And that's not the relationship you've got. So I would make sure you've got the relationship with the mastering engineer, not the label so that you can then make sure it sounds how you want it to sound and not how the label want it to sound or the fact that the label are getting the track done for 10 quid off a guy in his garage rather than going to a, a big mastering place that you might go to with someone who you respect and someone you've got a relationship with. You know, so you don't know where it's going to go. Make sure when it goes out into the world, it's how you want it to sound rather than who knows what it's going to sound like. Next question, Alexander Hume. Great episode as always, Streaky. Thank you. What do you recommend for power conditioning? Okay, power conditioning, when it's coming into my room, I've got an Isotech substation. Now, I think it's it really helped my sound. It did really clean all the all the sound up for me. Very difficult because it's you're not you can't exactly A B. You can record and you can hear. So you can you can turn it on and go, okay, yeah, that it's got a different vibe to what I'm normally used to. You have to really know your room to sort of be able to do that. So failing that, you can record before and after and then see how that sounds for on an A to B. I've not done that. I just went with what I knew and I liked it. And also I just wanted to make sure that I had clean power coming in. So it was kind of a given that I would do that anyway. In a pro environment, you really want to be having your power supplied well. Otherwise, it's, your gear is not going to run as juicy as it should. Yeah, I've got an Isotech substation. I think I bought it on eBay. So it was a little bit cheaper than the like two and a half thousand they wanted on their website. So yeah, Isotech try that. I know there's Furman power conditioners. I don't know what they sound like. I've not used them. I have, a, I've, I've used the little strip ones, but I don't think they're sort of heavy duty power conditioning. I think they're more just for like, just say everything's got the same earth on a power strip. But um, yeah, try those Furman or Isotech 
So that's this week's questions. Please ask your questions below, hashtag AskStreaky, and I will get round to answering them next week for you. If you like this kind of content, please go to my website, go to streaky.com, sign up to the newsletter. I give loads of things that I can't do on YouTube, point you in different directions of stuff that I've seen. It only comes out once a month, and so December's has already come out, so the next one will be in January, starting the new year. So go to streaky.com, sign up for the newsletter. You won't be disappointed. I won't spam you, promise. It's just once a month and it's full of good stuff. Giveaways, discounts that I get from suppliers, blah, blah, blah. So do that. If you haven't subscribed, ring the bell now so that you subscribe. I'm trying to push my subscribers up, so help me. If you like this content, please share it with your friends, family, and your grandmother. I'm sure she'll be well into it. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Bye.